Hello, my name is Lori Craner, and today I'm talking to you from my third floor bathroom. I know this is an unusual place to record a presentation, but hey, this is an unusual presentation. Back in 2014, I began the Privacy Illustrated Project, in which I asked people to draw pictures of what privacy meant to them. I visited schools, handed out markers, and asked kids to draw privacy. I went to community events and entreated people to draw something, even if they had no artistic skills. I paid crowd workers for drawings of privacy and collected drawings from students in my classes and people attending my talks. I now have a large collection of colorful drawings that include many elements that don't come of much surprise. Locks, doors, windows, eyes, houses, and cameras. I have some pretty cool drawings of animals that carry their privacy with them. And I have over two dozen drawings featuring what is perhaps the most quintessential example of a private space, the bathroom. I first noticed the bathroom drawings among the contributions from children, simply drawn toilets, some with stick figures perched upon them, some with doors and siblings depicted waiting on the other side others with heads sticking out from shower curtains or hovering above bath water. Accidental intrusions on bathroom privacy are depicted with cartoon bubble screams. Ah! Bathroom privacy resonates with people of all ages. Adults drew feet peeking out from below public bathroom stalls and smiling stick figures enjoying a shower with a locked door. While children drew the bathroom as a refuge from siblings, Adults drew themselves sitting on a toilet and enjoying a quiet break. One contributor annotated her drawing with a note. This is the only time during the day when I am truly alone and nothing bothers me. No man, no children, no dogs. The frequent association between bathrooms and privacy reminds me of a thought experiment carried out at CHI 2014 in which a team of hackathon participants posted rather convincing signs around the Toronto Convention Center announcing that the Quantified Toilets Company had installed smart toilets that were analyzing biological waste and tracking individual data. An accompanying website displayed a real-time stream of anonymized data, purportedly from the Convention Center's toilets. Although the website was a hoax, the thought experiment was an eye-opening experience for many CHI attendees. A few months later, as I was writing an exam for my usable privacy and security course at Carnegie Mellon University, I struggled to come up with a good question that would force students to go beyond traditional policies and checkboxes when answering questions about usable privacy notices and consent experiences. Recalling quantified toilets, I asked my students to propose a usable approach to notice and consent for smart toilets in public bathrooms. The students' responses were thoughtful and creative. Since then, I have used this design problem as a group exercise in my university classes, as well as in conference tutorials. At conferences, I distribute markers and chart paper to attendees at each banquet table. After talking about privacy design, I tell them about some existing smart toilets, smart urinals, and bodily waste surveillance systems. Then I introduce them to the fictitious Quantified Toilets Company and explain that in order to sell their toilets for use in public restrooms, they need to figure out how to provide notice and choice. I ask each table to come up with a design proposal, thinking about how notice is displayed and considering how the bathroom might be redesigned. Up until now, most participants have never heard of smart toilets, but I expect that will change. Nonetheless, this is a design problem they can relate to immediately, and each participant tends to come at it from a slightly different angle. After some uncomfortable laughter, the room starts to fill with eager discussion. Some start thinking about legal requirements. Others think about ergonomics. Some are concerned that people won't want to touch a physical button and instead design buttons activated by voice or with foot pedals. Others note that people touch toilet flush handles anyway and propose to integrate choice mechanisms into those handles. Some are concerned that when people hang a purse or a coat on a bathroom stall hook, it might conceal a privacy notice. 
Others wonder about concerns of transgender people and how visually impaired people might be notified. Still others ponder whether children can legally provide consent and what should be done if someone uses a toilet without making a choice. After some discussion about where to place notices and buttons, participants often consider the timing of the choice. Do people have to choose before they use the toilet? Can they choose before they flush? Can they revoke consent after they flush? Some wonder why people might be willing to consent and whether people might be interested in seeing their own data. Maybe people would like to take a copy of their data on a receipt or view it on their smartphone. If people decline to consent, will they trust that their data isn't actually being collected? Maybe it would be better to just have two toilets, one with sensors and one without. What if there's a long line and people are coerced into using the toilet with sensors because they don't want to wait for the other one? Some start to question why organizations would install these smart toilets in public restrooms at all. Will they be effective for monitoring the spread of disease? Indeed, wastewater testing has been used by universities, meatpacking plants, and municipalities to help pinpoint COVID-19 outbreaks. Wastewater testing is actually pretty interesting from a privacy perspective, as it allows for aggregate testing without exposing individuals. In Pune, India, sensors in public toilets will provide early detection of outbreaks of cholera and other diseases, as well as information about vitamin deficiencies. Might this approach be used by employers to find out which of their employees are pregnant or on medication? Would law enforcement use data from stadiums and shopping malls to catch illegal drug users? What other privacy issues might arise? Some applications of smart toilets require tying toilet sensor data back to individuals. Fingerprint readers could do that, but a 2020 paper by Stanford University researchers suggests that unique anus patterns may be a more foolproof biometric, although one that may not be acceptable to users. One of the Stanford researchers was quoted as saying, the thing about a smart toilet though, is that unlike wearables, you can't take it off. Everyone uses the bathroom. There's really no avoiding it. And that enhances its value as a disease detecting device. In a case of science fiction becoming reality, a disturbing YouTube video from 2014 takes the form of a mock infomercial for a smart pipe that analyzes wastewater in homes and businesses and uses anus recognition to tie data to identifiable people. In a more recent animated video, a smart toilet detects that a man has been eating cupcakes in violation of his diet and tries to blackmail him to collect stool samples in exchange for not reporting the cupcake violation to his insurance company. So discussion of smart toilets leads to some interesting conversations about privacy with useful pedagogical value. The smart toilet notice design problem also lends itself to a discussion of evaluation methods for privacy notices and consent mechanisms. Unfortunately, such evaluation is not yet the norm. Without evaluation, we are left with privacy notices that people don't understand and most don't even try to read and consent mechanisms that are hard to find and often confuse people. Researchers who study consumer notices emphasize the importance of evaluating disclosures through user studies. But how exactly would you evaluate a privacy notice and choice mechanism for a smart toilet? To start with, we need to identify some goals and metrics. As with most notices, the purpose is to inform consumers so we can measure the extent to which users understand the key points of the notice and ask them what choice they would make. Privacy advocates might suggest that the most effective notices are the ones that lead the most people to opt out of data collection. On the other hand, smart toilet manufacturers might suggest that the most effective notices are the ones that foster trust in the smart toilet technology and lead people to opt in to data collection. I argue that neither of these approaches are measuring the right thing. What we really want to know is whether users understand the choices they selected and whether it matches their actual preferences. So after users exercise a choice, we want to ask them to explain what choice they made and why. 
we may also want to ask them some questions to understand their preferences regarding the collection of various types of data, as well as various uses of data. Then we can see whether the choice they made is consistent with these preferences given the data practices stated in the privacy notice. These evaluations could be done in a lab or online study by presenting the notice and choice options to users. This will provide insights that will help improve wording and result in better comprehension, but user behavior in such a study may not match user reaction to a privacy notice when nature is calling. To evaluate the notice and choice mechanisms in context, we may want to set up an experiment in an actual bathroom outfitted with prototypes of the proposed notice and choice mechanisms. The toilets in the bathroom need not have working sensors. Indeed, there is less risk for participants if data is not actually collected. Participants could be given an exit survey after they leave the bathroom. They may be told up front that the smart toilet sensors are hypothetical and asked to behave as if they were real, or researchers may use a deceptive approach, as was done in the CHI 2014 thought experiment, and debrief study participants after they finish an exit survey. The logistics of conducting a user study in a bathroom are certainly more complicated than conducting such a study online or in a lab but an in-situ study is likely to reveal real-world factors that otherwise wouldn't be observed. Besides privacy drawings and the quantified toilets design exercise, I also use bathroom images in my usable privacy and security class to illustrate other privacy-related concepts. For example, I have many images of difficult-to-use bathroom fixtures and interesting public restroom features that I use to illustrate the need for usable privacy mechanisms. Photos of toilets with icon-laden buttons illustrate the need for privacy controls that are intuitive or accompanied by clear instructions. I have always been confused by these icons for airplane laboratories. It took a while to figure out that the central icon was a mirror hanging over a sink. Does the red arrow mean that it is available or not available? These icons are truly adorable but I didn't understand what they meant until I saw this version with words to explain that they are a nudge to hurry up in the bathroom as others may be waiting. There are many privacy concepts that really don't lend themselves well to intuitive icons. We're going to need to put words next to them, at least until everyone becomes familiar with them and learns what they mean. I have a large collection of photos of confusing hotel shower controls. How do you make the water come out from the top? It turns out you have to pull a ring under the bottom faucet. Which way do you turn the handle to make the water hot in this shower? Should I align the handle or the small pointer on the opposite end with the red section of the scale? What about this one? The shower is off, yet the pointer opposite the handle points to on. Shower handles are sufficiently confusing that in some hotels, they now post instructions for how to use them. With so many one-handle shower fixtures in the world, you might think we would come up with standard conventions and a clear way to label them. It turns out there are some approaches that are better than others, and some seem to be catching on. I think the handle in this shower actually works pretty well. Here's a close-up. You can see that the handle acts as the pointer. No need for a separate pointer on the opposite end of the handle to confuse you. If you try to turn the handle to the left from here, it won't turn. So you have to turn it to the right and the water is immediately cold as the label shows. And then as you continue turning the handle, the water gets warm and eventually hot. This is simple and works well as long as you can read English. With the addition of some hot and cold icons or red and blue colors, this would likely work in any language but sometimes designers don't follow standard conventions. Normally you pull handles, but this one you push. To make privacy interfaces more usable, we need to come up with some standard approaches to do common things, and then we need these approaches to be widely adopted. Similarly, this approach to water-saving flush handles seems to require a lot of explanation. But this one is fairly intuitive and seems to be somewhat standardized. It is easy to learn and remember, and it is used consistently. 
That's what we want to do for privacy interfaces. Another problem we have with both privacy interfaces and bathrooms is hidden controls. I remember entering this hotel bathroom and desperately searching in the dark for the light switch. I eventually found it behind the towels. In this bathroom, I could not figure out how to unplug the drain in the sink. Eventually, I noticed the control behind the faucet when I saw it reflected in the mirror. Likewise, I still remember vividly my encounter with this shower in a Jerusalem hotel in 2010. The water only came out of the handheld sprayer, but not the top shower head, until I eventually found the control located behind the handle. A colleague confessed that he never did find the control and had resorted to a workaround. He tied the handheld sprayer to the top shower head using the belt from the hotel bathrobe. Neither showers nor privacy controls should require such workarounds. Sometimes the features you are looking for are located exactly where they should be. This sink turns on the water automatically when you place your hands underneath, and then when you move your hands to the left, the water turns off and the hand dryer turns itself on. Privacy controls should be that easy to find and use. Of course, I also have photos of compact but awkward fixtures as a reminder that inconvenient interfaces annoy users and that we shouldn't sacrifice usability to save space. If something is broken, it is helpful if you let people know what they can do in the meantime. But really, you should do your best to fix it quickly. At the Davos Congress Center, where the World Economic Forum is held, the bathroom stalls include a remote control and a wall-mounted quick guide for adjusting the controls to wash and blow dry your private parts. But who has time to figure out something this complicated while rushing to make the next conference session? An app to find and securely access public restrooms sounds great. But apparently, when these first launched, you could only use these restrooms if you had a smartphone with a US phone number. It is important that we consider all the use cases. There are some bathroom designs I really like. In some cultures, people are very sensitive about hearing their bathroom sounds, so they tend to flush the toilet multiple times while they are doing their business to drown out these sounds. This is a solution that plays flushing sounds over a speaker and doesn't waste water. I think this is a great privacy-enhancing technology. There are other cultural issues we sometimes need to address in bathrooms as well. This is a case where icons work well because they are directly showing something physical rather than an abstract concept. This is a bathroom stall lock. On the inside of the stall, the user slides a latch to lock the door. This causes the green empty indicator to disappear and be replaced by a red occupied indicator. It is a simple mechanical mechanism that guarantees the correct indicator will be seen based on the state of the latch. This is a great set of instructions that includes a relevant example, with the restroom number embedded directly into the example. And this is a very simple low-tech solution to a privacy problem, covering the gap where the bathroom stall door closes. The latest fad in public restrooms seems to be the use of transparent glass, which you can turn opaque with the touch of a button from inside the stall. In this public restroom in Japan, the architect used this technology so that people would be able to see from the outside that the bathroom was clean and that nobody was inside. Some people love it, but others say they are scared that it could suddenly become transparent while they are using it. Finally, I was excited when I found this news article discussing the differences between public e-toilets and tea toilets in Pune, India. The article explained that Indian women do not like to use the e-toilets shown on the left because there are no instructions outside the toilet, they are located in places where women have privacy concerns, and they are hard to find. Not many women are aware that they exist. On the other hand, the pink tea toilets are easy to find, attractive, easy to use, and they are located in more privacy-friendly locations. This is a great lesson for our privacy features and tools. I hope you've enjoyed these lessons from the Lou. Let me go over a few key takeaways. Privacy concepts are often abstract and don't always lend themselves to intuitive icons. You may need to add words to aid understanding. 
We should design easy to understand privacy controls and standardize them so that people don't have to figure out new controls for every system. Don't hide important privacy controls where people will have trouble finding them. Put controls or links to controls right where people will look when they are ready to use them. Build privacy enhancing technologies that are simple, intuitive, attractive, and fail safe. And always test your privacy tools and notice and choice mechanisms with typical users and context of use. And finally, if you're trying to explain privacy engineering concepts or reason about privacy issues, take a bathroom break and look for some inspiration.